This morning as we look at our fourth installment in the Hoosier One series of sermons, I'd invite you this morning to turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And we're going to be talking about the rich man and Lazarus today. The rich man and Lazarus. And the title of this sermon today is Here Today, Hell Tomorrow. Here today, hell, tomorrow. And I want to start by saying this today. If you want to have an awkward conversation with someone, there's two things that you can have a conversation with someone about, and it will get awkward really quick. The first one, as we all know, is their political affiliation. A awkward conversation can be had because adults nowadays just don't know how to have a conversation because nobody can agree to disagree anymore. So that's one thing that people feel awkward about. Another one is people's faith. If you start talking to somebody that's of another faith and you start to tell them that Jesus Christ is the only way you're going to get to heaven and if you don't know him, you're going to die and go to hell. You're talking about an awkward conversation. That is a conversation closer right there. And if the Holy Spirit has not been already dealing with that person's heart and them desiring not to go to hell, they're desiring to know there's got to be a better way than, like I said, what an awkward moment that might be. But this morning, we see a conversation going on in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. And this is Jesus telling us about this. And we are going to read verses 19 through 31, and then we're going to go back through, and I want to share a few things about this with you all. Because here's what I want to remind you of. Who's your one? Four weeks ago, I asked each and every one of you to start praying that the Lord would show you at least one person to invite to our December 6th service because I will stand here if I'm living and breathing and I will preach a sermon on hope and how Jesus is our only hope. And there's hope within him that can't be found in anything else in this life. No other person, no other possession, no other place other than Jesus. And a lost and dying world needs to hear that. And in doing so, we challenged each of you to understand exactly what we're going to talk about this morning. We are not promised our next breath. In fact, this week that became a reality in that young man's life. You know, you think when you're young, 17, 18, 19 years old, that you're going to have a lot of life before you. There's some people in this room that may be in their 60s and their 70s. And yes, you have had a long life. But the Bible does not promise us that we're going to live that long, does it? And what we have to understand is when God places a one on our heart, that God is already working in the life of that one. And all he's asking us to do is our part. Be faithful. Go and invite, go and talk to that one and tell them exactly what Jesus is laying on your heart. Don't tell them any more, don't tell them any less. Just tell them what the Holy Spirit has directed you to say. I shared with you last week that 78 out of 100 people when invited would come to church. 78 people out of 100 will actually come with an invitation. So as we continue to work toward that December the 6th date, and as I continue to try to prompt you and urge you to learn who that one is and to act upon that one, I want you to understand today that if we don't interact with the lost people, Lost people will die and go to hell. 
And I want us to listen to this carefully today. The words of Jesus in Luke 16, verse 19, it says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, heaven. And the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades or hell, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf that is fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot. Nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. We live in a day and time where one has risen from the dead and people are not persuaded. People could care less. And those that do think they care, they say, on another day, I will care, but not today. I've got more living and I want to do it more my way. Well, let me just tell you, every day of life that we live is precious. But I also want you to know, as we look at this scripture this morning, there are a few contents within this scripture that we're going to examine today. One is, the rich man and the poor man die. Did you all know that you were born to die? It's amazing, isn't it? The Bible says that the day that we die is a more precious day than the day we were born. But we look at the day as we were born as the precious day and the day that we die as a sad day. Why is that, do you think? I personally believe it's because many people that die don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and we know they're going to hell. That makes for a sad day, doesn't it? But as we look at this this morning, we know that the poor man and the rich man die and we know that the poor man goes to heaven and the rich man, hell. Now, is he in hell because he's rich? No. He's in hell because he didn't choose God. He didn't choose Christ. That's what sends the rich man to hell. And we also know that the rich man, he looks from hell to heaven, and he begs for three things within this scripture. He begs for mercy. He begs for water. And he begs that someone would go and talk to his family. And we're going to circle back around to those in a moment when I tell you there are some good things in hell. Now that contradicts what you've heard preached before, doesn't it? Because we always think about hell as being bad, don't we, Josh? But I'm going to share that there are some things that this scripture that we have just read says that there are some things good in hell. Now you hold on for that one. Don't fall asleep on me this morning. 
Because I want you to hear those things. But I also want you to understand this morning that it is not God's plan to send anyone to hell. You know, the most known verse in the Gospel of John is John 3, 16. But in John 3, 17, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. As we spoke last week, Jesus' mission was to seek and save those who were lost. And therefore, our mission as Christians, trying to follow in the way of Christ, is also to seek and save those who are lost. But unfortunately, I'm afraid that we don't appreciate our days. We don't appreciate why God gives life. We don't appreciate our friendships. We don't appreciate our families. We don't appreciate our opportunities to seek God in prayer and then to go on a saving mission for him. And I want you to hear a quote this morning as we think about the rich man going to hell. This comes from a a Puritan pastor by the name of Richard Baxter. And he lived his life from a dual perspective, heaven and hell. And I think of that quite often myself as a pastor. And he directed his church members on how to spend a day with God. And in that day is a reminder of how important it is for us to acknowledge heaven and hell. And he says, and I quote, Let God have your first awakening thoughts. Lift up your hearts to him reverently and thankfully for the rest enjoyed the night before. And cast yourself upon him for the day which follows. Familiarize yourself so consistently to this that your conscience may check you when common thoughts shall first intrude. Think of the mercy of a night's rest. Now listen. Think of the mercy of a night's rest and how many that have spent that same night in hell. How many in prison. How many in the cold with hard lodgings. How many suffering from agonizing pains and sickness, weary of their beds and their lives. Think of how many souls were that night called from the bodies, terrifyingly to appear before God and think how quickly days and nights are rolling on. How speedily your last night and day will come. Here today, hell tomorrow for those that don't know Jesus. Observe that which is lacking in the preparedness of your soul for such a time And seek it without delay, he says. So this morning, as we think about how quickly eternity can come into our lives, I'd like to outline this passage with you. And I'd like for you to turn with me over to Revelation chapter 20. I want to share verses 13 through 15 with you this morning. Revelation 20, verses 13 through 15. And I want to read this scripture by first prefacing it by saying, Until the great white throne judgment, hell is permanent. Until the great white throne judgment, hell is a permanent place. But after the great white throne judgment, hell is not permanent the permanent resting place of those who do not believe. But I will share that with you in this scripture. Listen. It says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life 
was cast into the lake of fire. This morning, I want you to know that one day, the final resting place of hell, death, the grave, the false prophet, Antichrist, Satan, all of the demons of hell will be the lake of fire. But unfortunately, it will also be the final place for many people that we loved in our lifetime. But I also want you to make sure today that it's not your final place. And I say that by saying this. Today I want you to make sure that if you were to ask yourself the question, if I die right now, would heaven truly be my home or is the reality of it, I don't know. Because if you don't know, then there is an opportunity that hell could be your final home. And I share this with you, especially to those that are older in here that haven't grown up in this church. If you were sprinkled as a baby somewhere, and you're expecting that to be what takes you to heaven, it's not going to happen. Because the Bible says that we have to be drawn by the Spirit of God to the Father. It is not a decision that your mother or your father can make for you when you're a baby. It doesn't matter what good your parents want for you. That does not decide the decision of whether you spend life like the rich man or like Lazarus in heaven or hell. It doesn't matter if you came forward as I did the first time in VBS at eight years old because my friend Joe came forward. I came and bowed my head and because I was the son of a deacon when taken into the back room and asked questions about do you understand what you're doing? I gave them all the right answers because all I heard in my, my house was the Bible. I knew everything to tell them. But guess what? The Bible says that Jesus told Nicodemus you must be born again. There's got to be a spiritual change of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell within the person that saves our soul, that changes us from death into life. So this morning, don't take it for granted that you did what your grandma said was the right thing to do. And if you seriously ask yourself that question, if I died, would I go to hell? If that worries you, then today is another day that the Lord has made that you can bow your head and you can say, because the Holy Spirit is bringing that up to you to want to know. You can bow your head and you can say, I surrender, as we just sang. And you can repent of your sins and you can ask him to be your savior today. But then let's think about those people that I've been asking you just one. Just bring one to the church on December the 6th. Who is your one this morning? Who is the person that the Lord has laid on your heart this morning? Because we don't want them to go to hell. Especially if the Lord has given us the opportunity to play a part in their life. We know that until the great white throne judgment, hell is permanent, but then one day it will be thrown in the lake of fire. We also know that hell is a painful place. Look with me in Matthew chapter 18, verses 8 and 9. And it says, if your hand or your foot, now these, this is Jesus talking. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Susie, ain't that something? Jesus says that hell is such a tormenting place that the pain of cutting your own hands and your feet off is less than being thrown into an everlasting torment like hell will be. The very words of Jesus this morning as he shares that with us. And then look with me there in Luke chapter 16 at the very words 
from this rich man. In verse 23, it says, And being in torments in hell, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Hell is a, plain, a painful place. The Bible teaches us. We also see this morning that hell is a place of separation from what we know as love and what we know as living. Here in Luke chapter 16, verse 26, it says, The servant, oh, excuse me, I'm in the wrong place. Verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can he, nor can those from there pass to us. Now, I had plenty of thoughts on this. But I thought about the one thing that touches a parent's heart the most is your children. I want you to imagine... That if your child was in distress and they lay there hurt, in bad shape, and all you could do is stay where you are and not go to them and not supply any help whatsoever to them. And all you could do is stand from afar and look at their pain and their suffering how that would torment our souls. As a parent, not being able to get to the child that you love the most to help them. And that's the closest thing that I can think of on this side of eternity of what it must feel like in the rich man's shoes to be there in hell looking across this great gulf Seeing the beggar Lazarus being comforted with Father Abraham and not being able to get there yourself. Regardless of how bad you want to be there now, you can't be. There is no other way to get there. You're doomed. And folks, that's why I am so adamant about us figuring out who our one is. Because when I think about what the Bible says is going to happen to those that don't know Christ, I feel compelled to do something about it. And I hope that you will too. We've got to. I mean, how can we call ourselves a Christian, Carl, if we don't care? Knowing that this is going to be the outcome of that person's life if someone or something does not intervene. Severe physical and mental suffering. Hell's a place of separation. I want you to look with me over in the book of Isaiah as we look at what happened to the king of Babylon right before the fall of Lucifer. It talks about hell in verses 9 through 11 of Isaiah 14. And it says, hell from beneath is excited about you. Hell opens its mouth up wide for as many people as it can get. And that's the lie of the devil. It's for as many people to go there as possibly will. But it says, hell from beneath is excited about you to meet you at your coming. And it stirs up the dead for you. All the chief ones of the earth it has raised up from the thrones. All the kings of the nations and they all speak and they say to you, have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to shoal and the sound of your stringed instruments. And listen, the maggot is spread under you and worms cover you. Torment, maggots, worms. 
Is that what we want for the person that all we have to do is get out of our comfort zone and be able to share Jesus with them when the Holy Spirit says, share with this person? As I said before, I'm not asking you to say nothing more, and I'm not asking you to say nothing less. When you're prompted by the Spirit of God to speak to somebody, and if you're praying that the Lord will show you someone, He will show you someone. He will. I mean, I know that as, as much as I do tomorrow's Monday. That he will show you someone if you seek him and you ask him. And why should we seek him and ask him? Because somebody that we love and we care for will be in torment. Will be covered with maggots and worms and destruction. And will be separated from everything and everybody. How can we pass that up today as believers? How can we say it's not my problem? Or I'm not educated enough. Or I don't know what to do. The Holy Spirit will show you what to do and what to say. And many of you know the Bible more than I do. The Lord just haven't, hasn't called you to this office that I have. So let's think about how real this is. Jesus himself is telling us it's real in this situation this morning. Hell is a real place. This king falls. Anybody else can as well. Now I shared with you that I would tell you a few good things about hell. So I'm going to do that. The first thing is based off of Luke chapter 16, verse 21. And now, for those of you that might want to dispute that there are good things in hell, here are the verses that you have to argue. Luke 16, 21 tells us that desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked Lazarus' sores. Why was Lazarus at the gate? Because a rich man clothed in purple who fared sumptuously fed Lazarus the scraps from his table. In my book, guess what? That's no different than you being in Wilmington, seeing a homeless person on the street with a sign saying, need food. You go buy Chick-fil-A to get yourself a sandwich. You buy an extra one. You stop at the stoplight. You hand it out the window and you give it to the homeless person. Even a person who isn't a Christian can do that. The rich man is in hell even though he's a good person. Not only was he taking care of his own affairs, but he was taking care of feeding this poor man, Lazarus. So good people are in hell. The second thing that I want to tell you that's good about hell is in verse 23. And being in torment in hell, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. I want to tell you that there will be good vision in hell. It says that in his spiritual body, the rich man lifted up his eyes and he looked across the distance because his eyes were good and he could see that Lazarus was being comforted in Abraham's bosom. So not only will there be good people in hell, but there will be good vision in hell. Now also in verse 24 of that same chapter, it says, Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. There will be good prayers and people begging God for good things in hell. Just a drop of water on the tip of his finger is all I ask. And he's begging for it and he's praying for it as he is there in hell. I also want you to know that one of the last things he talks about that is good from hell is his memory. In Luke 16, 25, he says, But Abraham said, 
Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And then he goes on and he says to them that uh, in, your, in your life you have received good things. It says he fared sumptuously. He wore purple linen and he had a memory of the things that he had on this side of eternity even when he was on the side of hell in the other part of eternity. So guess what? That tells me that the things that we want to remember and the things we don't want to remember will be present with us if we go to hell. People in hell will have a good memory. They will remember those things that may have kept them from going to heaven. Now as we think about these good things that aren't so good... I also want you to know that he had good priorities in hell. Luke 16, verses 27 and 28 says, Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. The rich man had good priorities in hell because he did not want his family members to go to this very place where he was at. So this morning as we get ready to close, I want you to also know that people who go to hell have good intentions. They have good intentions. Haven't you ever met a good man or a good woman who died without Jesus Christ? Haven't you ever attended a funeral where you could not comfort a family by saying, They are in a better place because they do know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I have. And there's no comfort there for you to speak to those people. Because their loved one did not bear any fruit. Did not show within their life because they never darkened the door of a church. They did not pray. They had ways that showed that they did not honor Christ. But one can reject Christ through outright rebellion. That's many of your testimonies this morning. That there was a time in your life where you rejected Christ because of rebellion in your life. But there's other ways that you can reject him as well. One is apathy. You know what apathy is? It's just not caring. I'm just not interested in church. Not interested in the Bible. Not interested in God. As we sit here this morning, sometimes we say it's too hard. It's over our head. We don't understand. A lot of people use those reasons and then they die without God. Some have indifference. They lack concern or sympathy. For others, it's procrastination. I'll live another day. I'll do it tomorrow. But then for others, it's just lack of knowledge or information. Why? Because no one ever prayed for them that they would be sent by God to speak the truth to that person. And that's the whole point of the Who's Your One series of messages. So that we actually would be the one that would go and do the work of the Lord. Why? Because people we love and we care for, this is... The outcome of what will happen. Really this will happen in their existence. If someone doesn't intervene. Through the power of the spirit. So I conclude with this this morning. Turn with me to John chapter 14. Verses 1 through 7 simply says. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Listen, I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. And how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Hell was not prepared for us. It wasn't. In fact, Jesus, he says in this scripture that he goes away to prepare a place for us. But so many of us, because we don't acknowledge Jesus Christ, we go there. So many of your friends do not acknowledge Jesus Christ, they will go to hell. Your family members, they will go to hell for lack of knowledge, for rebellion, just for not taking the time and doing nothing. They will go there, but they don't have to. Because Jesus tells us that he has prepared a place in heaven for those who believe in him. In John 14, 5, Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Well, Jesus simply says in the very next verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then last, the Father says, has been revealed through the Son. Jesus looks at him and he says, Boys, if you've known me, you've known God. We make Christianity too hard. Sometimes I think if when you were getting ready to accept Christ yourself, <clears throat> for those of you that are really saved, If someone would have told you that if you didn't lead 10 people to the Lord in your lifetime, you were going to revert back to hell, you'd have probably just said, go ahead and stamp my passport and send me there. Because everything within you says, I can't do it. But we have to realize that we are the instruments of the Lord. We are what he uses to keep people from going there. <clears throat> and it is a bad place that we don't want anyone to go to. If you're here today and you've asked yourself, if I die right now, would I go to hell? If that troubles you because you don't remember being drawn by the Holy Spirit to God, And your life don't seem to be bearing any fruit for Jesus Christ. Because you're living in sin more than you are the ways of God. Today is your day to bow your head. Because if it's bothering you, the Holy Spirit's giving you yet another opportunity. To bow your head and ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. And to let him know you believe in him. And that you want to be filled with His Spirit. That you want to live your life for Him. That you want to keep people out of hell. Today is your day. And for those of you that know Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, and soul, live like it. Do the work of the Lord. And as I said, don't do any more than the Holy Spirit tells you to do because you'll do wrong. Don't do any less than the Holy Spirit tells you to do because then you've chosen once again wrong. Just do what the Word of God says and what the Holy Spirit tells you to do and you'll be right every time. Let's all stand this morning. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way. End of conversation. This morning as the music plays, I want you to pray for two things. If you don't know him, I want you to pray for yourself.
to God. And then I want you to come up here and tell me that you did it. Because he says, if you won't acknowledge me, I won't acknowledge you before my Father. So yes, you can do that. And then two, if you haven't asked God for who is my one, so that you'll have somebody to come in here on December 6th, or someone that can come to the drive-in service on December 6th at 9 o'clock, I want you to start right now. Because I want you to think to yourself, you know, I had forgotten how serious hell really is. Because I'm not going there. You know, I, it just slips my mind that it's a place of torment. And this message has really reminded me that those that I love and I care for will go there if someone doesn't do the work of the Lord. And Lord, I want to be that someone. So as this music plays, I would ask you to take this time to pray.